Tim grew up in Moscow and apparently met some members of our audience at a much younger age there. Um, obtained his PhD in biochemistry at Moscow University and established a research program there before he emigrated to the US. Um, he's been at Northeastern University in Boston since 2001, where he's now the director of Antimicrobial Discovery Center and a university distinguished professor. Um, so, so as most of you probably know, the issue of increasing resistance of bacterial pathogens to our current antibiotics is a, an issue that's been on the front page of newspapers, journals, and everything, and everybody's attention. Um, and we're really fortunate to have Dr. Lewis here today to tell us about his work, because he's really been at the forefront of attacking that problem. Um, I, I think I first became aware of, of his work and his interests um, when, he, when he started talking about persisters and bacterial persistence, and he's been one of the pioneers in recognizing and inve investigating that phenomenon in which a small subpopulation of cells are not killed by antibiotic treatment but remain ready to grow when they get the chance in uh, reestablishing the infection. Um, we have a second talk from Dr. Luce tomorrow at Lambda Lunch. That's at 11 a.m. in Building 37 tomorrow morning um, in the sixth floor conference room. If you need more information about where and what that is, let me know. The, t the title of that talk is Stochastic Changes in Energy Levels Produce Drug-Tolerant Persister Cells. Today's talk, he will um, he'll be discussing his exciting work on the search for novel antibiotics and along the way developing really interesting and important approaches to growing unculturable bacteria. And the, the title of the talk is New Antibiotics from the Microbial Dark Matter. And please join me in welcoming Kim Lewis to NIH. Thank you very much, Susan, for a kind introduction. And thank you, Susan and Michael, for an invitation to this uh, really great place. I get to see it uh, sort of from the other side, uh, uh, which is also a pleasure. Uh, so uh, what I will tell you about today is um, some of our basic science and how that informs our drug discovery efforts. Uh, and uh, I will start with this uh, sort of a textbook presentation uh, of uh, bacterial resistance. And uh, what you will see here is that there are lots of different mechanisms, uh, decreased penetration, efflux, enzymatic inactivation, uh, or target modification. Uh, and, and really, each and every logical possibility has been realized in nature. And it is because of this uh, plurality of mechanisms and their spread, uh, at least in part, that we find ourselves in the antimicrobial uh, resistance crisis that uh, Susan mentioned. Uh, and uh, apart from just the threat of uh, infectious diseases uh, per se, uh, one of the things that is becoming increasingly clear, and I'm sure at the NIH that experienced uh, uh, you, you know, a number of uh, cases with uh, resistant Klebsiella not so long ago, uh, it is the fact that without effective antibiotics, we do not have uh, the enterprise of medicine that we uh, are used to having. So you cannot do chemotherapy or surgery if you don't have effective antibiotics. Uh, but uh, this problem is compounded by another phenomenon, uh, which uh, is related to chronic infections, uh, another way that bacteria use to avoid being killed by antibiotics. And it comes from this paradox of chronic infections. Antibiotics are ineffective against antibiotic susceptible pathogens. Now, that makes absolutely no sense, uh, and because it's a paradox, and that's the nature of paradox. They, it makes no sense. And so I was attracted to this problem uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, and these chronic infections are often associate with biofilms, and there, there's a long list of them. And this is, of course, tuberculosis. And, and one commonality among those two uh, is the fact that the immune system is not very efficient in attacking uh, the pathogen. And then um, at the pathogen, which is otherwise susceptible by simple tests on a Petri dish, susceptible meaning doesn't grow in the presence of antibiotic, 
that same antibiotic is fairly ineffective at uh, treating the infection in a human. So uh, investigating uh, biofilms of a number of species, we found uh, this uh, pretty simple uh, biphasic killing phenomenon where with increasing concentration of antibiotic, you see that the bulk of the cells easily, are easily killed. There's not, nothing special about them. And then you hit upon this small subpopulation of cells uh, that do not die. Uh, so that seems to be uh, the culprit. This culprit are persister cells uh, discovered uh, in, originally in 1944 by Joseph Bigger, uh, who was unable to sterilize the culture uh, of staph with penicillin, was very frustrated that uh, he was unable to do that, uh, published a paper in Lancet called These Cells Persisters, and that paper was largely forgotten uh, for a couple of decades. So we, uh, if you will, rediscovered persisters in the biofilm and realized uh, that that is uh, very important uh, probably very important medically. And so we wanted to, of course, figure out what is it that makes these cells uh, uh, essentially invulnerable uh, to antibiotics. Now, uh, today I will give you some highlights of our, <clears throat> of our work in this field. I will talk uh, in much more detail tomorrow. And today I will give you sort of sufficient background to then um, uh, explain what we are doing uh, with the drug discovery. Uh, okay, so, so first of all, we wanted to know in principle w what is it about these cells that allows them uh, to stay alive. And we thought that perhaps they are dormant because they neither grow nor die in the presence of antibiotic. Uh, and so here's our view of these uh, uh, two you know, phases of threat. These are resistance mechanisms. Uh, and the resistance mechanisms, all of them, do essentially the same thing. Uh, they prevent antibiotic from binding to the target, and that is what allows the pathogen to grow in the presence of antibiotic. Uh, now, in order to understand uh, this other phenomenon, tolerance, uh, which persisters exhibit, uh, we need to appreciate that uh, bactericidal antibiotics kill not by inhibiting targets, but by corrupting them. Uh, so, for example, I mean the glycoside antibiotics uh, will cause uh, mistranslation, uh, that forms misfolded toxic peptides, and that is what kills the cell, not uh, because the ribosome stopped uh, turning out proteins. So if your targets are inactive uh, in a dormant cell, or largely inactive, uh, then uh, the target uh, is not corrupted and the cell survives. So this uh, seemed to us like, <clears throat> like a reasonably good guess. We learned how to isolate persisters, got their transcriptome, and uh, in a transcriptome, we were looking for uh, proteins, for genes and proteins that have this ability to stop inf important functions in the cell. And one of the first things that uh, uh, we noticed was the overexpression of a number of toxin antitoxin systems in E. coli. So the toxins and antitoxins uh, have been known for a while as a, a mechanism of plasmid maintenance. You have in a plasmid this uh, two gene operon. Uh, and if the daughter cell by accident loses the plasmid, then uh, the more labile antitoxin gets degraded. Uh, the toxin binds to its target, and uh, depending on what that target is, either kills the cell or causes stasis. But then people started sequencing genomes and discovered toxins, antitoxins, uh, in copious numbers uh, in genomes, like there are uh, around 80 of them in M. tuberculosis, for example. So our simple proposition was that uh, what these things do in the chromosome is they uh, are persister genes, at least some of them. So here I will just give you a summary uh, of what uh, we at, and other groups, Ken uh, uh, Gerdes and Natalie Balladans found uh, over the years. Um, so uh, uh, what we found is that different toxins, antitoxins, uh, will cause persister formation by inhibiting protein synthesis, degrading mRNA, or this uh, interesting mechanism that Toby Dore in my lab discovered where the SOS stress response turns on uh, this B toxin, which causes a decrease in protein motor force uh, and, and ATP. Uh, so these are... Uh, highly redundant and uh, parallel pathways of persister formation. Uh, so, so armed with that information with them, from E. coli, we then decided that um, 
it would be useful to find out what's happening in other bacteria. And at, at that time, Brian Conlon, a talented postdoc, uh, joined my laboratory, and he came from a staff lab, so he wanted to figure out what's happening in gram-positive bacteria. And the first thing that he did is he knocked out uh, toxins, antitoxins. In Staph aureus, it has only three, uh, unlike 80 in, in M. tuberculosis. Uh, and so he knocked out those three toxins, antitoxins, and asked a simple question. If you expose these, let's say, growing cells to ciprofloxacin, then what will happen? And absolutely nothing happens. There is no difference in persister formation in the wild type or in the knockout. Same in stationary uh, culture. So that experiment immediately told us that what we learned in the previous decade of working with E. coli was completely useless. And uh, we need to start, useless for staff, right? Not for E. coli perhaps. Yeah, and that we need to start from scratch. So uh, we went looking for clues. Um, and one of the clues uh, that we thought uh, would point us in the right direction was the fact that staph uh, becomes highly tolerant in stationary states. So then we thought, well, maybe persisters in a growing population of staph that went into stationary early. So here's a, a, a simple test of that proposition. Uh, we have a, a stationary state marker uh, uh, cloned with GFP, and we're looking at GFP expression as the culture grows from uh, lack into stationary state. And you see that uh, there are stationary cells showing up in a growing culture. Uh, if you now take these uh, cells from a growing culture and sort them out, uh, those that are expressing a stationary marker and exposed to antibiotic, those are the only cells that survive. So those are clearly enriched in persisters. So we have this paradoxical uh, effect happening that a growing culture produces stationary state, which uh, they, I always thought that these are two completely different things. By definition, stationary are not growing, uh, and yet the growing culture produces stationary cells. So uh, what we were, were thinking uh, may be happening uh, and producing persister cells is that, of course, we know that in stationary culture, the levels of ATP are considerably lower. So we were thinking that maybe uh, persisters are, are cells uh, that have low levels of expression of key elements that are responsible for ATP production. And one of such key elements uh, in Staph aureus is alpha-ketoglutarate, because Staph aureus uh, likes to feed on collagen, and, and the pathway from collagen into central metabolism is through this portal, through alpha-ketoglutarate, uh, which is coded, uh, its dehydrogenase is co coded by the SAKE gene. So uh, Austin Nuxall, another postdoc uh, in the lab, uh, tested this and did a very simple experiment uh, where he has a, a GFP reporter to SAKE promoter, and he's looking at the distribution of expression uh, of this gene in the population. And now sorting out cells, shows that those that have low levels of expression of alpha-ketoglutarate survive a hit by antibiotic considerably better than the wild type. So this is our first mechanism. We were pretty happy about it because the alternative was that there is no mechanism uh, because lots of things are going to affect uh, the levels of ATP. Uh, but now we know that there are some uh, key elements that do that, and, and uh, uh, tomorrow I'll tell you about some additional mechanisms uh, in E. coli that we found. Okay, so here is uh, our uh, additional view of what's happening with persister formation. I think this is a general mechanism. The mechanisms that we and others have been studying before are toxin antitoxin dependent, and they are sort of specific and, and perhaps selective, selective for given bacteria. This, I think, is a general and important mechanism, maybe the most important mechanism, and that is that all of the antibiotic targets require ATP, of course. And so if ATP is uh, present at, at normal levels, then you get corruption of these targets by these antibiotics and death. Uh, and then um, if stochastically uh, the level of the target decreases, you get dormant cells uh, because ATP went low, and you get the target shut down. So that very simply explains uh, 
uh, the nature of persistors. It's uh, you know a pretty simple explanation. Uh, I must say that we overlooked it. We could have discovered this 10 years ago, but we didn't for reasons that I don't understand. Okay. So, uh, so apart from that, um, apart sort of apart from the basic biology of persistors, there's another thing that I wanted to uh, tell you about, and that is the important question of the clinical relevance of persistors. Um, so, uh, a friend of mine, Lou Rice, who's head of medicine uh, at uh, uh, at Brown, he told me a number of years ago that. Um, it is uh, very interesting that what you guys are doing with persister cells, and I'm sure amusing, but it has nothing to do with clinical manifestation of disease. Uh, we know why chronic disease is difficult to treat is because pathogen hides somewhere so that, uh, so that antibiotics don't reach it, and th th that's all there is to it. Uh, so it's um, difficult to uh, address that question. We were thinking to do a Koch postulate style experiment where you isolate persisters, which we learn how to do, you, we could it, introduce them into an animal and see if that animal becomes tolerant to killing by antibiotics. Uh, but the moment you introduce uh, persisters into an animal, they wake up. So you cannot do Koch postulates on persisters. Um, so that was a, a, a quite a big problem you know, for us and for others in the field. Uh, and the clue to solving it came from an experiment that we were doing on a completely different subject. So a grad student in my lab, Puja Balani, uh, was trying to catalog all potential persister genes uh, in E. coli. And uh, the way uh, she did that was to perform this pretty simple uh, selection experiment where you hit a culture with antibiotic, collect surviving persisters, repeat it a couple of times. And then you get enrichment and mutants that make more persisters. And now you can sequence the genomes of these uh, cells and figure out where those potential persister genes are. But if you look at this experiment, uh, what you realize is this is exactly what happens when we people are treated with antibiotics. Uh, we uh, get uh, periodic high doses of antibiotics and if being persister is useful for the pathogen, then there will be selection for hypersister mutants in the course of antibiotic treatment. So in a way, uh, millions of people participated in this experiment, including probably everyone present in this audience. Uh, and so we simply need to look at the results of this experiment uh, and decide whether there are persist hypersister mutants among clinical isolates. Uh, so that experiment we did, but first I will show you what we found uh, in the in vitro experiment. In the in vitro experiment, most of the hypersister mutants uh, turn out to be uh, mutants in different positions of this hip A toxin. So these are gain of function mutations in hip A toxin, which produce 100 to 1,000 times more persisters as compared to the wild type. So an enormously uh, strong phenotype, which of course gives uh, the pathogen considerable advantage in survival. So then Puja um, screened a large collection of E. coli isolates, primarily from patients from relapsing urinary tract infection. It was a chronic condition, uh, and found that in half of these strains, there were mutations in the hip A locus, including those very uh, mutations that we found in vitro. Uh, so, of course, we wanted to understand uh, mechanistically what is happening with this. Uh, and we knew something already about the hip A uh, protein. Um, so what we knew initially came from uh, a study that we did a number of years ago. We were trying to understand what is it that hip A does uh, in the cell to stop it uh, from growing. And uh, we didn't have uh, any leads, and uh, hip A was not homologous to anything according to BLAST searches, at which point um, I uh, uh, gave a call to uh, Eugene Kunin, and uh, I asked him to take a look at hip A, which doesn't look like anything in the database. So Eugene reluctantly agreed to do that after some arm twisting, uh, and uh, in a couple of days, uh, uh, Kira Makarova and Eugene sent me an email, 
which said that Hippe was a kinase related to the Tor family of kinases, which I thought was, was nonsense because uh, there are no Tor kinases in bacteria. Uh, but uh, the active sites lined up very well, and we found that indeed uh, Hippe is a protein kinase, and that was a sort of, in my mind, an example of pure intelligence informing science, right? Uh, that, was, that was a good, uh, a good clue. Uh, so HIPE is a protein kinase that phosphorylates glutamyl tRNA synthase in normally, and stops translation. But normally in the cell, it is present in the form of a dimer. This comes from our collaboration with Dick Brennan and Marie Schumacher, crystallography uh, team. Uh, and so normally, HIPE is largely inactive. All the mutations that we found to gain the function mutations, they happen at the interface uh, between these dimers, um, opening up the pathway from ATP to the active site and activating the kinase. That's why you get considerably more persisters uh, in these mutants. Um, so, uh, so this is the case when we understand mechanistically the nature of this high tolerance mutation. And we, uh, by then, uh, assayed a number of other pathogens. So all pathogens we looked at, and these are M. tuberculosis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa from cystic fibrosis patients, and Staph aureus, uh, in all cases we find hypersister mutants in clinical isolates. In, some, uh, in cystic fibrosis, about half of isolates we find are hypersister mutants. So it looks like there are these two phenomenon, uh, phenomena. Um, one is heritable resistance, and the other one we call heritable tolerance. Um, and to make uh, matters even more uh, difficult for us, there was a paper by Natalie Balaban's group that just came out uh, uh, in science uh, that uh, showed that uh, in the course of antibiotic treatment, the pathogen first acquires tolerance mutations that help the pathogen survive high levels of antibiotics and on that basis, resistance mutations are then acquired, right? So these two mechanistically distinct uh, ways of protecting themselves from antibiotics, they collaborate, if you will, in producing uh, resistant mutants. So we need to worry about both of these phenomena and take care of both of them. Uh, so what is it that we learned? How does that inform our drug discovery efforts? Uh, so the pathways of persistent formation in the model E. coli are multiple and redundant. And uh, uh, many of these persisters are going to be low in ATP. So if you have redundant pathways, that means you have, don't have a target. If you have low ATP, that means that uh, no antibiotic is going to kill. Uh, so what we found uh, tells you very simply uh, that uh, drug discovery is, is, rather, is rather hopeless. Um, so from that uh, unpromising basis, we were thinking how to get something that's going to kill persisters. Uh, when Mother Nature comes up with a perfect defense, uh, what we know is that it also provides a response to that perfect defense. Uh, and so we were wondering if... Uh, among natural products, there may be something that evolved to kill persisters. Because producers of, the anti of antibiotics face a very similar problem to us. They want to kill their neighbors, including their persisters. So what we're looking for, we're looking for a compound uh, that will bind an important target in a dormant cell, corrupt it, and kill the cell. And that is not going to require any ATP. Um, so that's the kind of a magical compound we are looking for. But once you formulate that, uh, then indeed there is a compound that comes to mind. Uh, this is uh, acyldepsipeptide, uh, a natural compound made by Streptomyces hawaiensis and discovered by a group from Eli Lilly. Uh, apparently someone from Eli was vacationing in Hawaii and brought back this strain that produces this antibiotic. Uh, so Lilly had a look at this compound, um, and at the time, this was 1985, everybody was looking for broad-spectrum antibiotics. Uh, this compound uh, only kills gram-positive bacteria, so Lilly dropped it. About 20 years later, 
uh, we were experiencing an epidemic of MRSA, which is still ongoing, and other gram-positive bacteria have become highly problematic drug-resistant one, ones. And so a group from Bayer take another, took another look at this compound. They made a more active derivative, ADAP4, and uh, they also dropped the compound, but before dropping it, they determined the principal mechanism of action. Uh, it, it is very interesting, and that's what attracted our attention. So uh, ADEP attacks the clip protease. The, cl the clip protease will normally recognize misfolded peptides with the aid of this ATP-dependent chaperone and digest them. In the presence of ADEP, ATP is no longer needed. The pore of the protease stays open, and it can degrade a misfolded peptide. So that's the key, of course. That's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for a target that can be corrupted without any requirement for ATP. So that seemed to us like a perfect uh, candidate for an antipersistic compound. Uh, but there was a problem, actually two problems. Uh, these two papers. Uh, one of them uh, reported that in the presence of ADEP, CLIP only digests peptides that are getting off of the ribosome and did not yet have a chance to fold properly. So that will, of course, only happen in a properly growing cell, not in a dormant cell. And the other paper identified the primary target, FTSZ. FTSZ forms a septation ring, and of course, that is also uh, only required in, in dividing cells, not in dormant cells. Uh, so, uh, so the question is, uh, what do you do when uh, facts clearly contradict your beautiful hypothesis. Uh, you have two basic options. One is you decide that your hypothesis is wrong, and the other you decide that facts are wrong. Uh, so I took a very careful look at these two papers, and I didn't find any pro problem with them. They're very well-executed studies. Uh, but like most uh, biochemistry studies, they are performed on a fairly short uh, a time span of about 10 to 15 minutes. And that is an issue because antibiotics act at a time frame of uh, hours and days, not a time frame uh, of minutes. So we decided to repeat this experiment at a more realistic time frame of 24 hours with non-growing uh, stationary state E. coli. This is uh, work of Brian Conlon, uh, who's now at Chapel Hill. Uh, and so here is... Uh, the full proteome uh, of, of Staph aureus after treatment with ADEP, and you see massive degradation of about 400 proteins. So it looks like ADEP forces the cell to self-digest. And uh, of course, we had a look at what happens with killing. And so this is a control with ciprofloxacin. These are growing Staph aureus. You see a biphasic killing. Same happens with rifampicin. If, if you add ADEP, you get complete sterilization. That was the first time that we saw complete sterilization with anything which is not bleach. Um, that was encouraging. And, um, and then we recalled why Bayer dropped the compound. They had a reason to do that. A clip P protease is non-essential, at least in vitro. So you get uh, high probability resistant mutants uh, that arise when there's a null mutation in, in the clip. Uh, protease, uh, the clip mutants become completely resistant uh, to ADEP. Uh, but we decided since uh, ADEP has this uh, potential to sterilize, we'll simply combine it with another antibiotic, doesn't matter which, to prevent the rise of resistant mutants, and we'll use a combination. And so here you see uh, sort of an attempt to, to kill an in vitro biofilm with conventional antibiotics, which is not doing very well. And here's a combination of ADEP with rifampicin, which completely sterilizes uh, a biofilm. And we also had a look uh, in vitro. Uh, AstraZeneca developed this model um, in vivo, I'm sorry, uh, in, uh, developed an in vivo model of a biofilm infection in the, thigh, in the mouse of a neutropenic, uh, neutropenic mouse thigh. And here you see the growth of a massive biofilm, and this is an incurable infection. And indeed, regular antibiotics do very little in this model. They kill growing cells, but then you hit upon the non-growing persisters, and, uh, and uh, this is an incurable infection. And again, ADEP rifampicin 
uh, sterilizes in this infection. Um, so th that gives us uh, an example of uh, a, an antipersister compound that tells us that nature did evolve antipersister compounds. Th that was the first, but I'm sure not, not the last antipersister compound. And um, a, a biotech company is now developing uh, this into a drug. Okay, so uh, in, in the remaining time, I will tell you about our efforts to discover uh, new antibiotics, uh, and I will start with this brief uh, introduction uh, into where the field is uh, at the moment. Um, so the field started with the golden era when the main classes of antibiotics were discovered, and they were discovered primarily from soil actinomycetes. Uh, and this was based on an extremely simple a screening that Selman Waxman developed and got the Nobel Prize for the screen. And the screen essentially emulates the accidental discovery made by Fleming uh, when Fleming, uh, you know, found that if he had a, a plate with Staph aureus that he was growing uh, and then uh, he got a, an accidental contamination, there was a zone of inhibition against, uh, around that contaminant. In the case of Fleming, the contaminant was a penicillium which was making penicillin, and uh, Selman Waxman uh, realized that you, that you can use that as a systematic screen, and he had sort of the genius to hit upon the world's best producers of antibiotics, uh, which are the streptomyces. How he managed that, I don't know, but, but he did. Uh, and so this very simple screen produces the uh, major classes of antibiotics, and that, and that goes on for a while very successfully, and then something happens around the 1960s, the mechanism of discovery is turned off. We go into the dark ages, and then there's a bit of a resurgence of activity, but this resurgence primarily defaults back to the golden era, uh, meaning that we are primarily taking initially failed leads and trying to resuscitate them because we don't have, we don't have novel compounds. So uh, we have a pretty good understanding what happened around 1960, and that is that this resource uh, the soil microorganisms uh, was in a way largely overmined by screening because uh, only 1% of them will grow on our petri dishes. Uh, the rest are the microbial dark matter that doesn't grow. Uh, so uh, with my colleague Slava Epstein at Northeastern, we decided that we will uh, try to revive the Waxman platform by going after this uh, microbial dark matter. Uh, so this is a simple experiment that sometimes is performed in our undergraduate laboratory, uh, which uh, illustrates what uncultured bacteria are. You take a sample from the environment, uh, like marine sediment or soil, uh, and, and you put one droplet under the microscope and you count the number of cells. The other droplet goes on a Petri dish, and uh, you try to figure out uh, how many colonies uh, these cells produce. And the difference in the counts uh, between the number of cells and the, and the number of colonies that they produce is known as the great plate count anomaly. Uh, that is perhaps the oldest uh, problem described in, in microbiology. Uh, it was discovered by Winterberg, an Austrian microbiologist, in 1898. Since Winterberg, uh, there's been a considerable effort uh, to tinker with the media and the Petri dish to try to push these uh, numbers up, and that did not work. So we decided to do something different. Instead of growing bacteria on a Petri dish, grow them where we knew for a fact that they do grow, and that's their natural environment. Uh, so we needed to, came up, uh, to come up with a gadget uh, where bacteria can grow in pure culture in their natural environment. Uh, so here you take a sample from uh, marine sediment, dilute it, and place uh, between these two semi-permeable membranes that get glued on an O-ring, which we buy at Home Depot, and this contraption known as a diffusion chamber goes back into the environment. So now everything diffuses through the chamber. Essentially, you, you're tricking bacteria. They don't know uh, that they're not in their natural environment, and not surprisingly, lots of stuff grows we get recovery close to 50% um, in the diffusion chamber as compared to the petri dish from this environment, which is really uh, low in cultivable bacteria. 
Uh, so our latest iteration, which is developed primarily in Slava's lab, the iChip is a uh, massively parallel version of the diffusion chamber. It's just a piece of plastic with lots of little holes, which you dip in a suspension of bacteria. Each well captures approximately one cell. So then you get isolation and growth in one step. You cover this with semi-permeable membranes, and this goes back into the environment with incubation. And you get microcolonies uh, in these wells. So of course, we were very interested in uh, trying to figure out why uncultured bacteria do not grow in a petri dish. What is, if you will, the, the molecular mechanism of uncultivability? Uh, and uh, so this is work from my lab, uh, and we decided to start with this, uh, uh, with the beach sand as, uh, as a model where uh, I suspected that on these uh, particles of sand uh, will be biofilm communities of microorganisms. So this is what you actually walk on when you walk on the beach. Uh, you walk on this. Uh, and uh, this is a, I don't know what this is, but it looks very imposing. <laughs> uh, so then uh, we had a, a simple hypothesis that perhaps uncultured bacteria, at least some of them, you know, do not grow because they require growth factors from their neighbors. So here's a test of this. You dump a heavy inoculum uh, from that sand particle on a petri dish, and, and you get a whole zoo of colonies growing. And then you say, well, maybe uh, this small colony grew because it happened to be in the vicinity of this bigger one that was releasing a growth factor. So here's a, a test of that, of that idea. Uh, here's a sort of a simple test where you patch one of them, the bigger one, uh, and it grows as a colony, and the other one you spread on a petri dish, and it only grows around this bigger one. Uh, that, uh, first of all, tells you that the idea is correct in principle, and that you have a bioassay. You can uh, purify uh, the growth factor by simply growing up the cultivable bacteria and fractionating it. So that we did, and uh, what we got is uh, these growth factors, which are turned out to be sidirophores, iron chelators. And if you drop one of them on a petri dish, it recapitulates uh, the effect of the helping organism. Uh, so sidirophores are iron chelators. And uh, normally, in an aerobic environment, iron exists in the form of insoluble iron-3. So bacteria release the sidirophore and then take the iron back and reduce it. Uncultured bacteria, interestingly, lost the ability to make their own sidirophores. They come from unrelated taxons, so it's a secondary loss. Why they lose uh, their ability to make sidirophores, and with it they lose their, uh, their liberty, they always depend on someone, uh, that is a fascinating question. But now they have to steal sidirophores from their neighbors, and that is how that's how they grow. So we got very excited when we found this uh, because I thought that uh, we'll just keep uh, finding additional growth factors and we'll close the gap in the great plant, plate count anomaly. That did not happen. Uh, with Sedier force, we can explain approximately 10% of uncultivability. We can go from about 1% to 10% cultivability. Uh, the next growth factor gave us 1% and then nothing. So. I don't understand uh, at the moment why 90% of uncultured bacteria do not grow, but I have a postdoc in my lab who is supposed to find an answer to this question by the end of this year. <laughs> so uh, one useful thing that we, uh, that we found is that once grown in a diffusion chamber, especially if you re-inoculate from diffusion chamber uh, to diffusion chamber, with high probability, you get growth on a regular Petri dish. So that, of course, gives you now access to considerable biomass and antibiotic discovery. And we've been collaborating with this startup, Nova Biotic. And so far, we have 29 new compounds. So I'll tell you about two of them. Uh, so one uh, compound uh, came from an effort uh, to solve a very tough problem in natural product discovery, and that's the enormous background of known compounds in junk. And so uh, the way chemists try to solve that problem 
uh, is to uh, ask the question whether you have a new molecule in your extract. That takes time and energy, and the answer is not entirely satisfactory because your new molecule can be a, de a new detergent, uh, which is not terribly exciting. Uh, so we decided that uh, one way to solve that problem uh, is if you go after species or group selective compounds. So nature has very few, if any, compounds that have been known to hit a particular group of bacteria. I don't mean gram positive, it's a very narrow group, like mycobacteria, for example. Uh, so then, uh, if nature makes compounds that are specific against mycobacteria, then you can do a very simple thing. You take an extract, and you, you're looking for this property. You're looking for uh, inhibitory activity against mycobacteria, but not against, for example, Staph aureus. Uh, if you can do that, then you can immediately say that your extract probably contains a new compound uh, active against mycobacteria. So by doing that, we discovered this new antibiotic, lasomycin which is very nicely selective against mycobacteria. It doesn't hit bacteria from the human microbiome. And it has an interesting, uh, interesting uh, property. If you look at stationary uh, MTB, it's very tough to kill them. This is our best killing compound, rifampicin. It gives you biphasic killing with surviving persisters. With lasomycin, we don't see any indication of surviving persisters. So we got very interested in this compound, and the postdoc, uh, Katya Gavrish, got resistant mutants for lasomycin, and all the mutations uh, mapped into, well, not map, we don't do mapping anymore, but sequencing showed that they all fall into the same locus. And that is the uh, CLIP C1 subunit of the, of the mycobacterial CLIP P1, P2, uh, C1, uh, a protease, which is fairly uh, specific for mycobacteria, it's also essential in mycobacteria, unlike in staph. So lasomycin, which, uh, has, which looks like this, that's why we gave it the name lasomycin, looks like a lasso, it binds the clip C1 subunit, and it does two different things. It inhibits in vitro the protease activity completely, but then also there's strong activation of ATPase activity. So if you look at what happens in whole cells, lasomycin collapses ATP in whole cells. And that is apparently what contributes or maybe is primarily responsible for killing by antibiotics. What I think is happening is that there is this mechanism of persistent formation that I just told you about, which is ATP depletion, but, but not the zero. And it looks like uh, lasomycin pushes the system down sort of an extra step into the abyss of irreversible dormancy. I think it's a very uh, sneaky mechanism, uh, sort of piggybacking on the natural way to make persisters uh, to get rid of them. So uh, it looks like we hit upon uh, an Achilles heel of persisters, uh, and it is this particular molecular machine which is under attack, the clip protease. Uh, so in Bacteria like Staph aureus, uh, ADEP, forces the protease part of this machine to degrade proteins, and that's how it kills dormant cells without any requirement for ATP. And in mycobacteria, a very different compound hits a different part of the same machine, forcing it to digest ATP. Uh, and of course, that doesn't require ATP either. Uh, it just mops up whatever ATP is in the cell. Why this particular machine is under attack by completely unrelated uh, uh, natural products is, is a fascinating question. Uh, okay, so uh, while I'm sure that there are uh, other uh, anti-persister compounds to be found, um, I will tell you about another compound that we found sort of related to, to this general problem of antibiotic resistance. And this is Texobactin. So this was discovered from this very interesting uncultured, and unusual uncultured bacteria, Eleftheria terra. Uh, this is a beta proteobacterium, uh, and that particular group of bacteria is not known to make antibiotics. It is a gram-negative bacteria, very different from, you know, your usual lactinomycetes. Uh, it forms a new genus, and we had to give it a name, so we gave it this name, Eleftheria terra which is free earth. You'll see in a moment why we gave it this name. Uh, 
This name is a mixture of Greek and Latin, which you're not supposed to do in taxonomy when giving names to creatures. But I figure that nobody cares about these things anymore. <laughs> so this, this is the name of the creature. Uh, Texobactin is an interesting complex molecule. And we checked it out for activity and found that it hits uh, a long list of gram-positive bacteria, including some nasty pathogens like MRSA and rococci, for which we have very little options clinically, uh, M. tuberculosis, um, and not so much against gram-negative bacteria. Uh, we tried to get uh, resistant mutants to this compound and failed, which was very frustrating because, uh, first of all, you do not have an easy path to determine the mechanism of action. But more importantly, in our experience, if you have no resistance development, that means that you discovered a new detergent. But in parallel, we were, always, we were also running a cytotoxicity assay. So in, in, this is against human cells. There's no activity against human cells. So that was very interesting. This is the first time uh, we saw a compound where there's no uh, resistance development and uh, no cytotoxicity. Uh, so uh, we examined it in a number of animal models. I'm not going to go this, uh, over this in any detail, just to tell you that it is pretty efficacious in several simple models like septicemia protection, mouse thigh infection, and mouse lung uh, in pneumonia. This is, all, this is all mouse. So that gave us uh, some additional encouragement that this compound is worthy uh, of investigating. And so then we uh, took a very care, in parallel, uh, the team at Noah Biotic, and in my lab we decided we'll in parallel investigate uh, resistance development. And uh, in microbiology, there's a protocol if you have a problem getting resistant mutant, there's a protocol how to, how to do it correctly. So we did it correctly. Uh, here's the control with ophloxus, and you, you add the antibiotic at sub-inhibitory concentrations. And each day you up the concentration. So if you have a mutant with any increase in resistance, even minimal, it will take over the population. You encourage resistance development. And then after about a month, you're supposed to do it for about a month, you get an enormous increase in resistance. And um, this is pretty much how all antibiotics in current clinical practice behave. What takes a back then, we did not see any, any change. So that was very surprising. Now, you performed a, uh, a specificity test to see if this is a, a compound hits a specific target. The test is very simple. You simply follow uh, the rate of label incorporation to these major polymers. And then this experiment takes so back that clearly selectively inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis and nothing else. So we know now that this is a cell wall acting uh, inhibitor. And there's no resistance development to it, so we concluded that this compound does not have a protein target. Uh, because uh, proteins uh, will always mutate, you will always have a mutant protein that does not bind uh, your antibiotic. Um, a realistic target, which is not protein, is a precursor of peptidoglycan lipid 2. So we, did, we started with a simple test. We had growing uh, staph aureus, which are not growing in the presence of taxobactin. If you add lipid 2 to the test tube, you restore growth, which means that it takes a back to the sequestered by lipid 2. So we're collaborating with Tanya Schneider, who uh, performed this, uh, another, a simple biochemistry experiment where you can isolate lipid 2 and see it by on thin layer chromatography. Uh, but uh, as you add taxobactin, you can no longer extract lipid 2 from solution, telling you that it is sequestered. And so using that method and adding different analogs or versions of lipid 2, you can then zero in on the exact moiety of lipid 2 that taxobactin binds to. And here's this moiety. It is, uh, it is the lipid pyrophosphate sugar part of the peptidoglycan precursor. This is the growing peptidoglycan. This is what takes obactin binds to. The nature of the sugar is not important. So that, uh, uh, that told, uh, told us that it will also probably bind, and, and indeed it does, to the precursor of another important uh, cell wall polymer, tachoic acid. It has the same structure, just a different sugar. So this investigation uh, tells us an interesting thing. 
uh, it uh, indicates that nature evolved the compound to be fairly free of resistance. You have, it hits two targets. Neither of these targets is mutable, right? These things are not coded by genes, at least not directly. The target itself is exposed on the surface of the cell, so you cannot pump it out. It's already outside. Uh, and uh, it appears that uh, the main dogma that we've been operating under, which is that bacteria will develop resistance to everything, uh, and in many cases rapidly, is probably incorrect. There are probably uh, compounds like taxobactin that evolved to be largely free of resistance development. So going after uh, those compounds, uh, I think, makes uh, a lot of sense. So with that, I will thank my team. Uh, I will thank my collaborators and support, especially the, the NIH, which has been supporting uh, uh, the work of my team over the years. And I thank you for listening. There's a question there, but I think you need to go to the microphone. Yeah, yeah well, you were speaking about biofilms and that you had uh, kind of beaten them. You didn't uh, pay it, uh, say anything about the structure of biofilms. Supposedly, they have an outer layer of protectors, and they have an inner layer of guys that are kind of protected, and then there's a, there's a lower layer or something else. There's certain hypotheses of how they are. Can you, the type of thing you're talking about actually beat all the layers of a biofilm or just particular bacteria that are laid out flat before a biofilm, mm. uh, an actual biofilm formation. That is significant because what you're talking about is medical devices that are going to be indwelling and they do develop all those different layers of things. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think they're uh, related to, this is of course an important question and there are two aspects to it. One is the ability of the compound to penetrate through the biofilm. And the other is the ability of the compound to kill cells in the biofilm. So the ability of compounds to penetrate into the biofilm has been well demonstrated, uh, with few exceptions. Like uh, most compounds penetrate fairly well into biofilms, like you know fluoroquinolones or beta lactams. Uh, there's some problem with uh, aminoglycosides. There's some retarded penetration. The main problem with the biofilm is not penetration into, but the ability to kill cells in the biofilm, which are dormant, and, and they are first, first and foremost the dormant persisters. What we showed previously is the, um, the most difficult cell, cells to kill are not cells in the biofilm, but cells in a simple stationary culture, right? Because the biofilm is growing, and the stationary culture is not growing at all. Uh, so ADEP kills cells in stationary culture and in uh, in vitro biofilms and in in vivo biofilms uh, that we have tested. Thank you. So, Kim, in the first part of your lecture, you spoke about different kinds of mm, mechanisms mm, behind persistent formation. And you kind of pointed out that there is a very general, non-specific mechanism that are involves more or less spontaneous fluctuation in ATP content, and then there are specific mechanisms uh, brought about by toxins and toxins. So could you elaborate on this somehow, under what kinds of circumstances, in right. what situations these yeah. specific mechanisms are involved? Well, my, I will elaborate, uh, Eugene, but my elaboration is limited by my ignorance. Uh, so I will only talk about some sort of clear examples that we know that we have at the moment. Uh, so a, a good example that we have is the induction of this B toxin. So uh, during DNA damage, you have uh, activation of the SOS response and of course uh, DNA repair that that response activates. And you have also an activation of expression of the this B toxin, which is regulated by the same Lex repressor, which controls the entire uh, SOS response. So this B gets uh, activated inserts itself into the membrane. It is a typical antimicrobial peptide, which is very, a very strange molecule uh, that diminishes the proton motor force, decreases ATP, and that's how you get persistence all, uh, under those very specific conditions of DNA damage. So, so in other words, under uh, 
particular types of stress, you would implicate uh, toxins and take toxins, but under, under general conditions, the spontaneous generation of persistence will be sort of stochastic fluctuation. I think, yes. I, I, my feeling is that probably under uh, conditions where the culture is not necessarily stress, is this primarily guided by fluctuation in ATP levels. Okay, that does make sense, thank you. Um, let me ask two questions about the sort of uh, environmental microbiology that comes out of some of the things you're doing. So, so for instance, for the siderophores that you see being borrowed by, um, non, by what was otherwise non-culturable ones, are those going to be specific to who's in, the, inv in the, the neighborhood? If you tried an unculturable from someplace else, would it not use those? Is there a, a specificity? Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a great question. And, and we examined that. And what we found is that there is uh, every logically possible scenario, <laughs> right? Okay. So, so we found some bacteria that will only take a sidirophore from a particular neighbor and no other sidirophore. And then we found those that, uh, that we could induce growth with each and every sidirophore that we could buy commercially and everything in between, right, so. So we'll eventually understand it, yeah. but not yet. And, and probably the answer to the, to the other question, so the, the bacteria that gave you your antibiotic, your, um, that hits the peptidoglycan, anything known about why it would be making this and uh, presumably killing off all its gram-positive neighbors, or? That's, a, that's an excellent question. So. Uh, well, I mean, in one simple scenario, you know, you want to get rid of your neighbors, yeah. right? That's just a common sentiment of, uh, at least, of wild creatures. We like our neighbors, but that's right? a special case. Uh, so, uh, but there is one particular property of taxobactin that uh, kind of tells us uh, why that compound. So, what we found about taxobactin is that it has a terrific activity to lice cells considerably better than any other cell wall acting antibiotic we looked at, probably because it hits these two targets. Uh, and so I think that this creature, Eleftheria terry, is a hunter. I think it hunts gram-positive bacteria, lyses them, and eats them. them with the help of this compound. Uh, can there be a drawn a parallel between um, uh, the mechanism you proposed and the tachyphylaxis, which occur um, when, uh, uh, say, receptor stops to respond to ATP duplications of an agonist, which is also ATP dependent. Uh, why not? 